גם יש לנו פעלה, אנחנו נצטרך להביא את זה, כי כשהיה אש, הוא חייב שאתה נתן לי את זה, יש לי שמעה את הבית שלנו, אני בא לך, אני
Le Cotters. Le Cotters. Jaya Radha Madhava Kandaviyari Jaya Radha Madhava Kandaviyari Jaya Radha Madhava Kandaviyari Jaya Radha Madhava Kandaviyari His divine grace shall see Bhakti Vedanta Swami Raj, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Pramananda, and all glorious to these sound devotees, all glorious to Sri Guru and Sri Garanga, Mo Vishnu Pradaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutta, Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tadamane, Namaste Sarasakam Deve, Gauravani Prasharane, Nirvishe Shashini Vadi Paschatyate Sitarane. Om Agana Timanandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chatsur Udnalitam Yena Tasmani Shri Guravena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stabitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Vidati Swapadanti Kam Pandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Parakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Sha, Shri Rupam Sagradatam, Sahara Raghunatam Vitam Dham Sajivam, 
Sarvaitam Savadutam Vridana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Vidan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vasakam Vitam Sha Hey Krishna Karna Sindo Dinabando Dugatate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namosute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Prashubhana Siddhadevi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kapa Trubhyasya Kripa Sinu Vyemacha Padina Vadeyo Vaishnavivyo Namonaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Pranitananda Chedwaita Gadadhar Shiva Siddhi Gora Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 8, Chapter 16, The Payavrata Process of Worship, Text Number 7. Kriheshu Yeshvati Doyo. Narchita Salilar Api. Yadi Nir Yanti Te Nunam. Peru Raja Griho Pama Peru Raja Griho Pama Kriheshu Yesh Vatitayo Kriheshu Yesh Vatitayo Narchitak Salilar Api Narchitak Salilar Api Yudhi Niryanti Tenunam Yudhi Niryanti Tenunam Peru Raja Griho Pama. Griho glass of water. Yidi if Niryanti they go away. Te such household life. Nunam indeed. Peru Raja of jackals. Griha the homes. Upama, like. like. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Homes from which guests go away without having been received, even with the offering of a little water, are like 
those holes in the field which are the homes of jackals. Purport, in a field there may be holes made by snakes and mice, but when there are very big holes, it may be supposed that jackals live there. Certainly no one goes to take shelter in such homes, lest the homes of human beings where atitis, uninvited guests and not properly received, are like the homes of jackals. Mom Vishnu Braya Krishna Prasthaya Buddha, Sri Mate Bhakti Viranta Swami Tinamane, Namaste Saraswatunde Ve Gauravanya Pacharane, Nirvishe Shashunivadi Pasvetya De Satana. Some continuation about culture and the Vedic system that people are treated with some respect, as Chanakabanda says. Matrivat paradareshu, paradwareshu lostrivat, atmavat sarabuteshu, yet pashiti sapanditaha. That a civilized person is one who sees every woman except for their wife to be just like their mother. And conversely, conversely, every woman sees every man except for her husband to just be like her son. Similarly, one sees everything, one's, everyone else's property as like garbage in the street, and one sees all living entities as spiritual beings equal to oneself. So that's considered a learned person. Nowadays, such an lear- education would be considered to be rather naive. People are taught to exploit each other. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite nowadays. One sees, one is taught to see every woman or every man as an object of exploitation. One is thinking of how to obtain everyone else's property. One is considered an advanced person in modern society if he has sufficient greed and intelligence to steal everything from everyone else. Then he's considered to be quite an exalted person. If you become a billionaire, it's usually not by pious activities. And as far as seeing everyone else, as being just like oneself, one doesn't, one sees everyone else as an object of exploitation, except for oneself. So instead of being a pundit, people are trained out to be a pundit, not pundits. And of course, as Prabhupada says, people are given a false sense of honor, they're awarded degrees, MA, BS, BA, PhD, and in that way, people actually believe that they're actually learning. They spend their whole lives studying germs and an insect, <laughs> and they get a PhD, and now they think they know everything. <coughs> no one can tell them anything. <coughs> so similarly here, uh, this is just a reflection of spiritual life. In other words, if one cannot act in this material world on a civilized platform, then there is no question of spiritual. Because in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Bhaktaram Jagatapasam, Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, Suridam Sarvabhutana, Gyatamam Shantim Richiti. In other words, the spiritual aspect of that is that in the mode of ignorance, one is thinking oneself to be the proprietor. And therefore, one doesn't see everyone else's property to be like garbage in the street. One sees a potential to acquire everyone else's property. But on the spiritual platform, one understands one can't really gain anything, nor can he lose anything, because everything eternally belongs to Krishna. It's just one's imagination that one thinks, I am the proprietor. Because actually, the entire universe is moving under Krishna's direction. And whatever we have now, which we won't have in the future, has been temporarily awarded to us by the material energy or the spiritual energy, uh, hopefully to utilize in Krishna's service. But in any case, whether we utilize it in Krishna's service or we utilize it for our sense gratification, 
we're only going to be able to maintain it or retain it for a very short period of time. Even Harani Kashipu was the master of the universe, but that didn't last relatively very long. Even he, he lost everything. And as far as being in the mode of passion, then one thinks oneself to be the enjoyer. And therefore one sees other living entities as objects of exploitation. But actually Krishna is the enjoyer. And unless we serve Krishna, which is our basic philosophy, then one cannot actually become satisfied or happy. Our basic philosophy is itatura mula nishechinena triptyanti tatskanda bhujo pushaka pranaharat chaya tendriyanam sarvatma tataiva sarvatmana yat tataiva. That as you itatura mula nishechinena, just like if you put water at the root of the tree, so the water will go to all the leaves and branches. So similarly, if we put food into the stomach, then the, stomach, the food will be distributed to all the different parts of the body. And itatura mula nishechinena triptyanti tatskanda bujo pushaka pranaharachaya tendriyana savarpanam yayatuteja And if we serve Krishna, then all the living entities in the universe they also become satisfied. So in the mode of goodness, one is thinking oneself to be the savior of others. That I'm helping people in so many different ways. I'm maintaining my family. I'm maintaining my company. I'm maintaining so many different things. But this is all a false idea because we're all completely dependent upon Krishna. Unless Krishna sanctions something, then it won't work. As Prahlad Mara said, Balasya Neho, Sharanam Pitaro to Shingha, Nartasya Chaganam, Udangato Majito now. So, Prahlad Mara said that a parents, they may try to help their children and maintain the child, hopefully he'll grow up, but still the child may die. Similarly, the medicine may be very good, and the doctor may be expert, but still the patient may die. And the boat may be very strong, and supposedly could cross over the ocean, but it may sink. And even if it doesn't sink, even you cross over, it doesn't mean you won't die anyhow. As I've said before, on the Titanic, supposedly the Titanic, went into the ocean, that the person who was working in the boiler room, the boiler exploded. And he was covered with oil. So when he was thrown into the cold ocean, because he was covered with oil, he survived. And he made it to the United States. But one month later, after celebrating his lucky escape from death, he was intoxicated. And it just so happened it was a little bit of rain had happened that day. And there was just a little bit of, of water between the sidewalk and the gutter. And because he was intoxicated, he tripped and fell into that little puddle of water and drowned. <laughs> or this lady, the ball in Bali, there was a bomb in one discotheque, but she left five minutes before the bomb went off. And she survived. In order to celebrate her survival, she went to Australia, to the northern part of Australia. And she was swimming with her friends, and one crocodile ate her in front of a <laughs> sign saying, beware of the crocodile. <laughs> so we may survive, but ultimately we, no one survives. In any case, one should understand that ultimately Krishna is the, the savior of everyone and that Krishna is the actual enjoyer and he's the proprietor. Now, seeing every lady as being like one's own mother or every man as being like one's son is just to help one come to that understanding without which one, it only remains moral principles 
which will not ultimately help one escape from birth and death. Similarly, to see everyone else's property as garbage in the street means that one will be a little bit more pious, one will not be hankering or lamenting so much. And similarly, to see every living entity as a spiritual soul, one will be able to relate to people in the proper way. But ultimately, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, not only we should see everyone as the same with ourselves, but we should understand what the purpose of human life is. That is, is to help others become conscious of Krishna. Yari Deka Tari Kaha, Krishna Upadesh, Amaya Aga Gurhana Tari Desh. Then whoever we meet, we only have one real business. That is to meditate on what I can say, what I can do, how I can think, so that I can help this person become conscious of Krishna, revive their relation with Krishna. That's our, ultimately our only relationship with others. We have no real relationship except for that. If we think this is my wife or this is my husband, and we don't have this idea that they're eternal servants of Krishna, and I'm going to utilize my position as a husband or a wife or anything else in this world to help others become conscious of Krishna, then it's called Shrama Evi Kevala. We're going to be acting in ignorance, and the result of ignorance is that we simply become more entangled in repeated birth and death. So, of course, people will think that this is very foolish, this is just like very optimistic, it's like pie in the sky, seeing everyone as spiritual soul. Uh, after all, it's dog eat dog in modern society. If you don't eat a do the other person, they're going to eat you. So this is modern society, and the result is that everyone's dissatisfied. There's no loving relationship. People are not trained. People don't realize that there's such a thing as training culture. If you go to most people's homes, I don't think they're training in the Vedic culture. They're basically teaching their children how to eat, usually not very nice things, how to sleep, how to, have, how to mate, and what is the process of defense. And they don't, because they're in ignorance, they have no real clear understanding of how to eat or how to sleep, or how to mate, or how to defend. Even the basic principles of animal life are quite mysterious for most people. They'll go and take self-help courses, how to eat. As if you need a PhD in dietetics to know how to eat. For instance, if you eat what you can digest, and you chew the food, then you've already graduated from postgraduate in dietetics. Similarly, sleeping, people can't sleep anymore. There's so much an anxiety that they need pills to go to sleep. And because the pills have a reaction, therefore they need pills to wake up. And because they have pills to sleep and to wake up, and they destroy the internal organs, they need pills to counteract the other things that are being compromised in the body due to the first two pills that you're taking. Therefore, in modern society, the average, I think, most people at a certain age are taking 20 prescription drugs a day. And they think that this is very advanced. But here it says that even basic things to treat people as human beings and to have some respect for them, so that if you come to, they come to your house, at least you offer them some water. Generally speaking, in wealthy societies, in so-called advanced modern society, then if you, someone comes to your house, and that you, you don't even bother greeting them. You see them from a camera, and you tell them to go away. And if they don't go away, then you call the police what to speak of offering them a glass of water. Now, in less advanced, so-called less primitive society, then people are actually much more civilized. That if someone comes to your house, you have all the time in the world for them. 
You're not looking at your watch. You're wasting my time. You've been here for 15 seconds. I got, my, I got better things to do than deal with you. I got to go out and exploit others and gain more money. Why are you wasting my time? Here's a glass of water that's $15. <laughs> Therefore, I hope people are in happy modern society. And they did a survey, survey where is the country, or the countries where people are the most happy, as you probably know, the place where they're most happy, where people consider themselves most happy, is Bangladesh. Probably the poorest country in the world. Because people have all the time for each other. As if we're going to love our car and our car is going to kiss us and make us feel good. <laughs> or our computer, my best friend is my computer. It's the only one that listens to me and obeys me. And my dog. So people, because they have no, in the spiritual world, everything is relationship. And even here in the material world, people take pleasure in relationships, but they're, they're more and more have a propensity to take, have a relationship with some de dead material object. And therefore they can't feel satisfied. Because how much can you actually get reciprocation from your car? You can turn it on and listen to it hum. Think, oh, my car loves me. It's humming to me. Or the computer. We can play video games and kill virtual people on the, on the game and feel that we're actually accomplishing something. Today I, I killed 20,000 people on my video game, so therefore I'm a good person. So obviously people, unless they learn the art of dealing with each, with each other in a civilized way, what to speak of a loving way, then they can't actually be happy, because the nature of the soul is to love. And without love, it feels like it's, not, it's missing something. But as long as people are trying to exploit each other, there can't be any question of love. <coughs> So as Krishna says, Nashti Buddha Yuktasya, Nachi Yuktasya Bhavanaha, Nacha Bhavi Tak Shantir, Ashantasya Kutak Sukam. That one who's not in Krishna consciousness or divine consciousness can have neither a controlled mind nor a steady intelligence, without which there's no possibility of peace, and how can there be any happiness without peace? So if we don't know what the aim of life is, we don't know what we're trying to achieve in this lifetime. And we think the, the object of life is to get more and more material resources and utilize them for eating, sleeping, mating, defending. And we have no conception of anything higher, namely that we're souls, then at least we're going to be in the bodily concept of life. There will always be an anxiety that we have to die. As everyone knows, in the back of our minds, we're afraid what's going to, when I die, when this body dies, where am I going? What's going to happen to it? But my society just tries to negate that through spe specifically intoxication and other types of sense gratification. So people don't think very deeply about the predicament that they're in. That very shortly they have to leave their body and they have no idea where they're going next. And therefore, if one is not in spiritual consciousness, if one is not conscious of one's spiritual identity, then the mind can't be controlled. And we can't have actual real knowledge or intelligence. And therefore, we're always going to be anxiety that I'm this body, that I have so many material problems, my problems are increasing as I go through old age, I'm becoming diseased, death is approaching. So we'll always be fearful. So the main disease in material existence is fear. Everyone's afraid. Therefore, people go to an astrologer, and they try to ask the astrologer, am I going to live forever? And if you pay the astrologer enough money, he says, of course. <laughs> here's your, here's your dakshin, give me some dakshin and I'll give you some remedy and you'll never die. As I mentioned, one king, he called all the astrologers in his kingdom, <coughs> asking them how much time they have left, trying to find out who was a good astrologer. So after the astrologer would go back to his astrological chart and tell the king, I have 20 years left to live. 
And the king said, you're not a bona fide astrologer. And he took him outside. He had his men take him outside and execute him. So this way, gradually, all the astrologers in the kingdom disappear. Hardly <laughs> any astrologers left. But finally, one astrologer, the king asked, how long do you have left to live? He said, it's up to the king. And he said, you're a bona fide astrologer. So no one really knows, no one can guarantee that my astrologer told me I'm going to live, you know, so many years. No one knows, even the astrologer doesn't know what's going to happen. Therefore, unless one actually, at least in the Vedic culture, there's some activities which will move one towards the spiritual consciousness so that one will become more receptive than if one is actually in contact with a bona fide spiritual master and, and their teachings, and therefore one will be more inclined to follow them. But one is simply spending their whole life exploiting others and simply making plans for more and more sense gratification, then spiritual life will seem just like a very antiquated, a really naive, a useless waste of time. And here it mentions jackals, of course, probably in Belgium, I don't think there are any jackals. In my court, there are many jackals. You see jackals all the time. But no one goes to live in their, the, the jackals never invite the devotees to come to their house. Come to my house, we'll give you some prashad. It's a nice big house, it's warm, don't worry. No, the jackals are quite inhospitable. And therefore, they're actually, their lives are wasted because they don't get any association with devotees. So similarly we find that in the Vedic culture, because people had the association, when they were poor, it says, just like we have the example of Nalakuvara, Nalakuvara and Manigriva, two sons of Kuvara, who were in the Nanda Kandana forest, bathing in the Ganges, Mandikini, Ganges, and they were enjoying with some celestial ladies there. Nardi Muni came by, and they were all naked. The ladies, they covered their bodies in respect to the great sage Nardi Muni. But Nalakuvar and Manigriva, they were too intoxicated to cover their body. And therefore, uh, they stood before Nardi Muni naked. So Nardi Muni realized that these people are they're very degraded that when one becomes too much infatuated with wealth, then one naturally engages in all kinds of sinful activities, especially meat-eating, intoxication, illicit sex, and gambling. Therefore, he cursed them to become trees, but with the idea that eventually they'd be able to see Krishna. So in that way, they were benefited because they were so uncivilized they didn't even realize that they were naked. Because nowadays, that's considered more or less normal. I remember for a while there, there was, in America, there was what's called the streakers. You've heard of the streakers? You've heard of the streakers? Yes. Yeah. They were naked people, they were running, like they had some event or something. So someone was naked, and they, they run through the event naked. That was considered to be quite in vogue. It was considered the thing to do if you were, if you were in the ink crowd, you, you were also streaking. So this is animal life. People don't realize that because they have no idea what the purpose of life is and how to achieve it. And engaging in illicit sex is the one thing that was sure to bring one to the lowest species of life, as Nalakula or Manigriva were engaged in. Therefore, they were cursed by Nara Muni as a compassion for them, so that as trees, they would actually realize their mistake in engaging in such sinful activities. Unfortunately, nowadays, people don't have that opportunity. It's actually encouraged sinful activity. People have more or less clubs to engage in sinful activity. And no one considers it wrong. Or maybe some people do. Like the Christians, they're very much against 
killing children in the womb, but they don't mind killing the animals. And sometimes hippies or whatever else, they're very much into, against killing animals, but they're very much into illicit sex. So so-called religious people have no idea what is the aim of life and how to achieve it. They don't realize that they're supposed to concentrate their minds upon Krishna. And by living a proper way in this material world, one will actually purify one's consciousness, one's mind, and have a much better opportunity to actually fix it on Krishna. So therefore the Veda culture in itself was not the ultimate aim, but it certainly helped one understand when one came in contact with the devotees, appreciate them more. As we can see in our experience of preaching, when people are vegetarians, generally it's easier for them to understand something about Krishna conscious philosophy. Those who are butchers, although sometimes they do buy books, but generally speaking, it's very difficult for them to understand what is the subtleties of Krishna conscious philosophy. What to speak of treating others as, as sentient beings. Therefore, when the king was asked, what is the destiny, or the king was asked, asked the minister, what, why are you giving so many blessings to these different people? So the minister replied, well, for the butcher, I'm giving them the blessing. You can't, don't live and don't die. Because when you're alive, when this person's alive, they're covered with blood, hearing the screams of the animals. Horrible life. And after they die, after they leave their body, they're going to the darkest regions of existence and they're going to suffer even more. So don't live and don't die. For the prince, may you live forever. So why did the minister give this, why did the saintly person give the prince the blessing, don't, you, can, you should live forever? Because now he has so much opportunities for sense gratification and he's enjoying so many different types of sense gratification, that after he dies, he's going to go to hell for his sinful activities. So better he lives forever. And for the devotee, for the brahmachari, he's engaged in so much austerity, suffering so much because of the austerity. When he leaves his body, he's going to the spiritual world. So better he die immediately and go to the spiritual world. <coughs> So this is the, for modern people, they would not realize what is the purport of such blessings. Everyone's trying to live forever, but what is the value of living forever if you're going to accumulate more sinful activities and now you're going to become a dog, but as you accumulate more sinful activities, instead of becoming a dog, you're going to become a grasshopper. So what is the value? of living longer, if at the end of life you're going to go into even a, a lower species of life. Therefore, when people leave their bodies, there's nothing to lament for, because that means at the end of their sinful activities, and whatever body they're going to get, uh, at least they're not going to get a lower one. But of course our aim is to teach people the culture of Krishna consciousness. Uh, by the chanting of Hare Krishna, by this distribution of transcendental knowledge, at least people will learn how to see things in a different way so that they can actually work for the benefit of others. And eventually they'll become hospitable, they'll become cultured, they'll become human beings, and they'll become in a better position to understand what is the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, and then our Krishna consciousness movement can expand more easily when people are actually prepared to, to accept it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Yes. Um, at a certain moment you spoke about fear, uh, that people in ignorance uh, are always fearful for what's going to happen to them, or something like that. My question is that, uh, even, even if you have Krishna in your life, if you try to live a religious life, there might be uh, pain uh, in your life, there might be difficulties. 
is it natural to always to also have like a fear for that 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 would increase or would you say that is actually my means that you're not Christian? Well, everyone's fearful. Even the devotees, unless they come to the Brahma Bhuta platform, state of Nishta, they're going to be fearful. Because as long as we're identified with this gross and subtle material bodies, then we have to be fearful. So just by practicing Krishna consciousness doesn't mean that we're necessarily on the platform of liberation. We're, we should be practicing to come to that platform. But that doesn't mean that we're automatically on it or situated on that platform. Only when we're constantly, without interruption, engaged in unalloyed service to Krishna, is there fear will go away. Otherwise, to some extent, we're going to have to be fearful. But that fear is an impetus to become more serious about Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada says, birth, death, old age, and disease Without these miseries of life, there's no impetus to make advancement in spiritual life. So without understanding misery of material existence, then we're, we're, we won't be inspired to make progress in Christian consciousness. So fear is actually helpful if it inspires us to become more serious about Christian consciousness. And at the same time, can we tell ourselves, well, actually you don't have to fear? You can, it won't make any difference. <laughs> you can repeat that mantra, but we'll still be afraid. As long as we're identified with this body, fear is concomitant with our material identification. You can't identify oneself with one's gross and subtle bodies and not be fearful. We're not controllers of the material energy. The material energy is controlling us. As long as we're in the illusion, then fear will also be part of that. Anything else? Yes. Question. Um, uh, what about is this like um, this fear when you have some disease or you need to? This is actually this is spiritual because you you correct in a Ayurvedic way your disease. And um, I mean when you you are I mean, is this is healthy is this healthy fear when you recognize that you have a pain and you immediately go to the doctor. And you can serve, uh, more than yeah, we're not. Just, yeah, we're not against taking care of the body. Just like if you have a car using Christian service and it has four flat tires, you don't think, well, we can't get too attached. <laughs> I'm not going to fix the tires. No, we're going to utilize the car. We have to maintain it properly. So if we're going to use this body, Christian service. We also have to maintain it properly or else we won't be able to maintain it or utilize it in Krishna's service. So our vision is that it's not our body, it's Krishna's body. And we're maintaining it for Krishna. So that we can serve Krishna better. All right, thank you very much. Grantharaj, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Kija. Shri Prabhupada, Kija. Or Pramanani. Kija.
Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare